Welcome to this webinar today on how to create a lead machine. First of all, let me apologize if you hear any strange noises in the background from the Manchester labs today. And it's not the guys here in the labs making the noises. There's actually work going on outside and around the building. Hopefully it won't interrupt us too much. Um, I'm Kenny Goodman. That's the ugly mugshot of me that was just slipped into this presentation about five minutes ago by my VA, to my surprise, because I've never seen that shot before. She must have got it from my wife. And I've decided to do this webinar today pretty much due to all the doom and gloom out there about the economy at the moment and about how desperate it is and destitute things are getting with America being downgraded and in, in Europe, you know, being pretty much on its arse as well. It's it's not a good time out there. But to be fair, lead generation is probably the best place to be right now because there's businesses out there desperate for hot leads, which we'll come on to shortly. Not only that, you, you'll be hearing a lot at the moment from internet marketers of people talking about evergreen, using the word evergreen, because they're finally realizing that launches are not a sustainable business. Well, lead generation is about as evergreen as it gets. And I'm gonna share with you why it is probably about as evergreen as it gets as we go through this. Another reason I've decided to do the webinar today is because every time I go to conferences, when I was at um, Adele's conference in London and also, James Shramko's, when I was speaking at that in, in Sydney, um, they always asked me to maybe present, next time I, I go and speak for them, to present uh, about my other business, Lead Generation, because if you know me, you'll probably know me for domain names, um, website flipping, website investing, that type of stuff. Whereas I, I actually have two main businesses that run side by side. One is lead generation and one is my domain and website investment business. And I was talking at Marty Rosmanith's WordPress Direct conference in San Diego recently. And I, I breezed a little bit on lead generation and a lot of people really did tap into that and wanted to know more information about that. And it also turns out that I decided to take on some mentoring students for the first time this year and I was teaching them on you know how to invest in domain names and websites and make money in that area and they've been really successful in that but a handful of them have tapped into my lead generation knowledge and created lead machines of their own so I think after all of this I've decided to teach this to other people and let other people like yourself know how exactly to create a lead machine. I've been doing it now for probably around about 15 years and I've created two $10 million businesses doing lead generation. I'm, I'm not one of these internet marketers who, who started off in my bedroom and have only ever done internet marketing. I've been in real business. I had 250 staff at one point. I don't have that many staff anymore and I'm bloody glad I don't because it was a arse ache, I can tell you. But I've learned how to do it and I've also learned how not to do it. And hopefully will save you a lot of heartache because you can really get lead generation drastically wrong. And I'm hoping after this presentation, you'll think, wow, I actually know how to do it. And I've also learned some very, very innovative and very powerful techniques more recently. And they're very simple to implement. And I'm gonna share this with you as well. So hopefully you'll get a lot from this presentation. So without further ado, let's move on to it. And first of all, let's look at what is a lead. Well, leads start off at a very base level at what I call a cold lead. And this is where you have information on a possible prospect. So that might be their name, their email address or just their email address or their name and telephone number, that type of thing. But they're completely unaware of who you are and you have no information on whether they're in the market for what you're actually offering. An example of this is years ago when I was selling um, mobile phones, 
we had a mobile phone business or in America, you may call them, them cell phones. And we had, you know, big call center with 250 staff banging on the phones, cold calling. And all we ever had were telephone numbers. We didn't even have the names of people. We didn't know whether they were in the market for what we had to offer. We didn't know when their contracts came to an end. So we were just basically banging the phones all day long. And I would that was at, at the point where I was working probably around about 14, 15 hour days. My staff were working 10 to 12 hour days. And it was really pretty demoralizing, especially for the guys on the phones, because you know, 150 calls per kind of lead was really, really desperate. It was a real, real tough times. And then fortunately I got out of that business. I sold the business, got completely ripped off because I was totally naive at the time. I won't go into the, to that here. I'll, I'll probably tell you it over a beer at some point. But I learned a lot from, from the dark mistake of being naive in business from that. But I actually did recruitment for a while as well, which was where we dealt pretty much with what I like to call tepid leads. And that is where you have information on a possible prospect, same as a cold lead. They're unaware of who you are, but you actually get information that they're in the market for what you have to offer and are actually the decision makers. That's a tepid lead. In recruitment, when I was in recruitment, we dealt with both cold leads and tepid leads. So we would call people up not knowing um, whether in the market for what we had to offer, but we'd try and get these, these lukewarm tepid leads Um, in the evenings actually, what we'd do is we'd pick up the phone and phone candidates, people who were looking for jobs in the evening. So once we'd finished our hard day job, working 8 till 6 p.m., then 6 p.m. till 8, 9 p.m., we'd call candidates up and talk to them about possible jobs and stuff. But one of our main sneaky um, lead pulling operations was to ask them certain questions, ask them questions like, have you been looking for, you know, have you been for interviews anywhere else so far? Have you been for interviews at any companies? Uh, Because we don't really want to send you to the same place twice. And at that point, you know, they'd either tell you they had or they hadn't. If they had, you would probe deeper. So you'd say, okay, where have you been for interview? Oh, I've been, you know, they might say I've been for an interview at um, Johnson & Johnson. Um, Oh, right, what position was that for? It was for you know, because I used to do IT recruitment, so they're saying it was for a Visual Basic developer position. Oh, right, okay. And who did you deal with there? Who was the IT manager? Was it John Smith? And they'd usually say, no, 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 it was, and then give you the name of the person. So at that point, you'd have the name of the person who was recruiting at that company, and you'd know the exact position they were recruiting for. So you had information on the possible prospect. They were actually unaware of who you were, um, but they had information, you, you had at that point information that they were in the market for what you had to offer and that they were the decision maker as well. So it was all about information gathering. So that was a tepid lead, which is obviously a lot better than a cold lead. The next step is also tepid lead, um, which you, you get a lot of this in information marketing in, in, in internet marketing, which is information on a possible prospect. They actually are possibly aware of who you are. Um, and you've got information that they're interested in your market, but you have no idea whether they can afford what you have to offer. And this is very similar to sort of like my website, Kenny.co. You know, I have a little lead capture form on there offering my Um, free report. So pretty much anyone who's got there is probably interested in internet marketing or domain names or that type of thing. And they've downloaded my reports. They know who I am and they're kind of interested in the market, but I don't know whether they can afford or whether they are a good fit for any of my paid elements, you know, any of my mentoring or my mastermind or anything like that. So they're still only a tepid lead. What I've worked on more recently is creating hot premium leads. And this is where you have a clear signal from a pre-qualified prospect. So you know they're the decision maker and you know that they're a perfect fit for what you have to offer. So they can obviously afford what you have to offer or they're just perfectly in line for what you have to offer. And not only that, 
they're showing that they're interested in what you're offering and would like further information and would like a chat with you. I mean, how good is that? That's a hot premium lead. And hot premium leads are so good because they're, they offer you super high conversions. So instead of banging the phones, speaking to people um, all day long and just getting the phone put down on you, these offer super high conversions because they're actually interested in you and they're chasing you. And this is where it's all at because you're converting sort of like nine out of 10 and they're happy to speak to you. They're already, you know, totally pre-qualified and they don't generally feel like they've been sold to. And this is what it's all about. It's all about the hot premium leads. And this is what we're gonna chat about today in a major way. Now there's two different types of leads. There's offline lead generation, which I still do, and there's some fantastic ways of really manipulating the system. We won't go into it here today too much, you know, that's for another chat, another time. But there's some super ways. I've got a good friend called Pete Williams who is a master technician at this. You know, stuff like sending postcards of somebody's website, you know copying their website, taking a screenshot of it, sending a postcard of their website to them with a really powerful message on the front can really grab their attention. And there's obviously online lead generation. And we're going to be talking about online lead generation today because it is, it's the low hanging fruit. And it's the low hanging fruit because there's actually, there's a lot of people online out there. There's 2 billion internet users on the internet right now. 2 billion and growing fast. Now over 50% of those, oh, well over 50% now, are on social media sites. So they're on Facebook, Twitter, that type of thing. And we've now reached what I call the tipping point of trust. Now, what does this mean? Well, the tipping point of choice is, let, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to uh, late 90s, 99, early 2000s, when we had the dot-com boom and then bust. Now, we had the boom because everyone was going, this internet thing is amazing, you know, with, with all these tech companies, let's invest into them. And everyone got caught up in the hype, but we weren't ready for it at the time because we didn't have 2 billion internet users. We didn't have over 50% on social media sites. In fact, chat rooms and dating sites had a huge stigma attached to them back then. You know, these days we're on chat rooms every day when we're on Twitter and Facebook. We now also have super fast internet speeds, which really helps things up and which has really tipped the balance of that trust and got us really using the internet in, in an avid way. The mobile is through the roof right now with over 1.1 billion smartphones out there. And we've also got, you know, iPads and other tablets, and it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And the result of all of this is that online lead generation is up 70% in the last year. And this is why we're going to talk about online lead generation today. And this is why you're going to find out all my deep hidden secrets on lead generation today, because there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there and I can't pick it all on my own. There is an issue though, and it's a problem for you because you're getting overloaded with information. I know exactly what it's like because I've had it up to my ears with all these, I get hundreds of emails in my inbox from different marketers offering lots of life-saving opportunities. And you get overloaded with this information, but you don't want to get left behind. So today, it is time to simplify. We're going to really get down to basics. I'm going to show you some very in innovative stuff, but I'm also going to share some very, very basic and simple stuff that a lot of people overlook. And that's why I'm absolutely creaming it with lead generation. And so can you. Now, first of all, I just want to go through who this information is not for, because I don't want to waste anybody's time today. It's not for people who peddle get rich quick schemes and don't really want to contribute at all. 
It's also not for people who don't care about quality because hot premium leads are where it's all at, but you need to be impeccable. You need to really give a shit about your customers and your clients. You need to really, really care about them. And it's also not for people who, who are kind of tire kicking, who just don't have a business and you know just don't know when they're going to start the business and have no real plan. If you don't have a business and you've got a plan in place, then it, it is for you. But if you don't have a plan, then it's not for you. So all of those three, if there's people who, don't, who fit into that, then it's probably not for them. It is actually for you if you provide a service or product like I do and you want super hot premium leads to work with. Or it's for you if you're looking to enter the lucrative world of lead generation and sell premium leads to others. You, I've, One of my mentoring students has just entered this wonderful world. I won't give away his niche at all. He's based in Australia. And he's just got into a niche where every lead, every time somebody fills out a form on one of his websites, because that's what lead generation generally is online, is just getting somebody to complete a form online, then you, you know, you're going to make big money. And, and he, every time somebody fills out a form on his page, he gets $200, which is pretty cool if you ask me. And it's also for you if you want to grow your business by providing outstanding value and quality. If you really want to care about your customers and your clients, then it's definitely for you. Or you could be all three of those, which I am. I'm all three of those. And that's why I absolutely love lead generation and what I do. And if you are the same, and if you fit into any of those, your timing is absolutely perfect. Because we're reaching at what I like to call a, the internet surge. And it is an unprecedented global internet surge right now. And unless you're a complete hermit, it affects you in a major way. Because this surge and, you know, you can feel it. You can see what's going on with social media and with mobile and some of the figures I've just showed you. I would go as far as saying that it's as important as the Industrial Revolution was to the planet. And it's even more important to lead generation. And also, if you, if you get into building a lead generation business and want to sell it at a later stage, because it's uncovering untapped, lucrative lead generation models and you're going to absolutely love it. There's no limits or barriers to entry. And it's what I like to call the perfect storm for online lead generation. Now, I've done hundreds of different lead campaigns. And I'm hoping you're going to be able to share a lot of the information I've learned from all these hundreds of different lead campaigns um, through what I call the three golden steps. I have three golden steps. There is a fourth that I may share with you at the end if we have enough time. Um, but I'm going to go through the three main golden steps today, which is number one is choose your prospects wisely. And that may sound a bit counterintuitive to you, but it's really important that you understand that you are now going to start choosing your prospects rather than them choosing you. You are in control. You are taking control of the whole situation. Also, you're going to need traffic. Let's not hide from the fact. Whatever business you're in, you always need people for your business. You need to turn on that traffic tap. And you also need to be able to learn how to attract them in a major way. And we'll cover that in the third golden step, which is on how to maximize the attraction. So let's look at the golden step number one, how to actually choose your prospects wisely. First of all, when you're looking to choose your prospects wisely, you first of all, believe it or not, and it may sound counterintuitive again, is you need to have a look at yourself. You need to have a good look in the mirror and kind of know a little bit about, more about yourself and ask yourself the following questions. What are your values and beliefs? You know, does your market 
product or service, does it, does it kind of resonate with you positively? Do you feel happy in what you're doing? Do you also believe you're adding massive value and you feel good about what you're selling? It, it happened to me years ago, back in 2003. And sometimes you can, you can actually get to a point where you, you, you're kind of almost going to make a mistake and miss the boat by questioning too much. So don't question too much just kind of know that it's all resonating together. I'll give you an example of where I nearly missed the boat because I've done a lot of stuff um, around self-development and meditation, all that kind of stuff. I'm really into it. All my mates call me a tree hugger and stuff. When I go away to retreats and stuff, they say, oh, he's going tree hugging again and stuff like that. But it's just something I've been into for the last, well, over a decade now. And I got into a business back in, I think it was 2003, lead generation business. And I got met a guy, a very, very sharp guy called Ayaz. And he was involved in what we call ambulance chasing, which is personal injury claims. But he'd got onto a government scheme, which was helping miners, coal miners, get you know, compensation that they definitely deserved, or miners' families, you know, deceased miners' families, get compensation from the British government. It was the biggest lawsuit against any government the world has ever seen um six point odd billion or something because back in 1954 they'd done studies that had proved that coal dust caused emphysema and other sorts of diseases but they let the miners carry on mining in in pretty bad conditions and stuff so they released information that they were going to hand out all this compensation but a lot of the miners didn't know about it now i had a difficulty i was like do i really want to get involved in this ambulance chasing because i had a real bad stigma attached to it that kind of industry and then i had a good chat with myself and i thought actually i'd love to help these people out because i was finding out more and more a lot of them didn't know about it and we set up a company and that was one of the companies that made over $10 million and it did it in a very, very short space of time. I was where I almost missed the boat and that was one of the first times I made a lot of money and I felt amazing because I knew at that point I was never gonna have to work for anyone else again and also I knew I was helping people out. The government scheme, unfortunately, it, we got caught the tail end of it. It'd been running for five and a half years at that point. We only caught the last six months of it but we made a huge amount of money in a very short space of time. Had we caught it at the beginning, wow, God only knows how much money we would have made. But know yourself, you know, question yourself, but also, you know, make sure that you don't make any mistakes by diving out of an industry without realizing where you could add value to people. Like I didn't particularly like that, that industry, but then I re realized I could actually add value to it. It was just some of the people in the industry I didn't like. You know, some of the operators, but I could actually make a difference in that industry, and we did. You also need to know your market, you know, and it's very easy these days. You've got the Google keyword tool, and you know, sticking on the personal injury because that was, you know, um, one of my markets, both on this side of the Atlantic in the UK and over in America. Um, you know, you just look at the Google keyword tool, and if you don't know what it is, just type it into Google, Google keyword tool, and it'll explain exactly what it is. And as you can see there, it kind of shows you the keywords that people are typing in. It shows you the global monthly searches that people are, you know, how many people are searching every month for that particular keyword or key phrase. Um, it shows you your local searches. So in this case, for me in the UK, shows me how many searches we're getting here. But it also, if you look at the last column there, it shows you the cost per click for people who are actually advertising on Google. And I'll show you more about this in later sections. But as you can see there, cost per click, that's pounds, by the way. It's not dollars. So dollars, you know, the top one there would be like $50 per click. So, you know... Per lead, they must be paying five, six hundred dollars within that particular industry. So that gives you a good example of you know how you can start, you know, kind of understanding your market by understanding the keywords people are typing in and what your competitors are paying per click as well. And moving on to competitors, you know, you should know who is actually ranking in Google. So you just need to type it into Google, some of the main key terms and see who is actually offering your product or service. And you can see in this section here, 
which is the section what we call organic results or natural search results, which is where people um, have got there through optimizing their websites, which is also known as search engine optimization, which we'll talk about shortly. Then just have a check and see who's there and see what they're doing. And also check who is advertising in Google. If you look on the top and then the, the, the right as well, these are adverts. So these are people who are paying per click. Like before when we talked about, you know, it was 30 pounds per click. Well, these guys here are paying around that sum between 10 pounds and, you know, 50 pounds per click. So every time somebody clicks on one of these adverts here to go through to their site, they're paying that. So you can imagine how much money's in the industry, which is a good way of, you know, gauging your industry. Also know who is advertising on Facebook and, you know, in magazines or in yellow pages or newspapers, that type of thing. Have a look around. Have a look at what they're doing and what their processes are. Mystery shop them. Call up or go through the process. Go online, fill out the form and see what happens next. Do you get put into an autoresponder sequence? How fast do they call you? Do they call you? Is there another route and know exactly what they're doing. Exploit their weaknesses, but build on their strengths. In other words, you know, copy what they're doing and do it better. Just have a quick swig of water. It's thirsty work, this is. Know your product or service. This is really, really important because you need to be seen as, you know, the leading expert. And you can be seen as a leading expert if you know your market as well. But you need to know your product or service. You need to know what the benefits of the product are and always sell with these in mind. So don't just do feature dumping. What uh, happens a lot when you go to a car sales room when you're trying to buy a car is they feature dump on you. I bought a car recently with my wife and my wife and the guy in the showroom was saying, yeah, it's got this air conditioning unit, it's got this unit, but he wasn't really saying any of the benefits. So he wasn't saying... This will keep you cool on a summer's day. Just little things like that. You know, another feature could be if you're in the loans business or mortgage business, they could say, yeah, we have a fully transparent online loan tracking system. Well, that doesn't mean a lot to people. So you want to put in the benefit there with it. You know, the benefit would be so you can see how your loan is progressing at all times and that you're not kept in the dark. Make sure you utilize a lot of benefits and know the benefits of your product or service. You should also know what it normally takes to close a deal, to sell the product. So is it one phone call? Is it no phone calls? Is it completely all online? Um, is it two phone calls? Is it face-to-face -face meeting or similar? Now, if, you, if you're new to an industry, you can't exactly phone your competitors and say, excuse me, how do you do this? So the best way to do it is either, you know, go through the process as a customer with them, or also just go on forums because most industries these days have forums where industry experts share information with each other. For example, I'm in domain names as one of my businesses. I go on DN forum. You should also know, obviously, if you want to choose your prospects wisely, then you should know your prospects. And you've got to know inside out, really, who your prospects are and, and one of the big questions is, do they have a massive need for your product or service right now? Can they easily afford what you have to offer? Are they perfectly aligned for what you have to offer right now? Also, look to see if you can see any patterns with your prospects. Do some deeper research. Are they of a certain age? You know, what's the demographic of the other, of a certain location, geographic location? Have a look further deeper into it. A, a good site you can go to is a site called quantcast.com. And, you know, sticking with the personal injuries theme here, I've stuck in lawyers.com, which is a, a big site in America, which will, you know, show you what that industry looks like. And as you can see here, you know, it's a few more women the men there, 58% you know, to 42% um, there. Um, you know, the main age range is 18 plus, as you can imagine, um, with the biggest age range being 35 to 49. And it gives you other bits of information there, like their income and that type of stuff. And it's completely free. And what you need to do is just go on there and check out your big competitors. And if they're not on there, just check out, you know, some of the big 
websites in your industry. It's a really useful bit of information there. So that's how you can start finding out a lot more about your customers and start choosing your customers. So the next step is to actually get traffic, get those eyeballs, get people interested in what you have to offer. And one of the quickest ways to do this online is to do pay-per-click. And I do a lot of pay-per-click because, especially when I'm entering into an industry, because it allows me to go in there and make sure that you know I'm, I'm dealing with the right keywords. And as we said before, you know, pay-per-click is these adverts you can see at the top and at the sides. And you can do your keyword research as we showed earlier. Um, and it shows you what the cost per click are and stuff like that. And believe me, not all industries are as expensive per click as this industry. It's one of the most expensive industries per click. There's a lot of cheaper lead generation industries out there. And it's a really good place to start because if you've got a little bit of a budget to, to do this, it can save you huge amounts of time building out sites and doing all your SEO and all that kind of stuff. A good place to check out what your competitors are advertising on, and it's free again, is SEM Rush. Remember, just to make notes of these, don't be going onto the websites, otherwise you will miss stuff. Just make notes and you can take action at the end of the webinar. And as you can see here, it shows you what they're paying per click. I've typed in here a UK website, national-accident-helpline.co.uk. Uh, this isn't my website, by the way. And it shows you what keywords they're advertising for. So it lets you know these keywords must be working for them, you know, and maybe it might be worth you having a, a, a check out of these keywords and giving them a little bit of a run for the money. Other places to advertise are places like um, Yahoo, uh, Bing, YouTube as well. But when I said at the beginning, keep it simple, always just try one thing first. I'm going to give you lots of information there, but try one thing first. And once you get that working and it's, it's profitable for you, then you can move on to other stuff. So when you're doing pay-per-click, what you need to do and what the aim is, is to find the converting keywords and remove the low converting keywords. Get those out because they're obviously costing you a lot of money. You need to find the converting keywords and concentrate your efforts on those. So the converting keywords are those within lead generation that either get people to pick up the phone and call up the number on there or complete the online form. And when you've got these converting keywords, you need to be creating relevant pages specific for these converting keywords. In actual fact, you should be converting relevant pages for any, any keywords that you do. It's really, really important that you do this, you know, and that means make sure that the keywords are in the URL. So for example, if you're in the personal injury and your website was called usclaims.com, then if you're going for personal injury claim as a key phrase, it would be usclaims.com forward slash personal injury claims. And then in the title, it would include personal injury claims, description, which is the meta description, headers, any images in there. And obviously content would contain it peppered throughout. So if you've got content written in there, which you should always have, you know, on each page, you should always have some content on there. 300 words plus is what I go for. Then it should have it peppered throughout. Don't keyword stuff it, make it sound natural and have it within there. If you're thinking this is a bit techy for me, don't worry about it. You can outsource all of this stuff. And there's techy people out there you can get very, very, very cheaply who can work for you either on a job by job basis or full time. This also, when you, when you sort out the um, keywords, relevant keywords for the pages, this will sort out your online SEO, which we'll move on to next, which is your search engine optimization. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is search engine optimization is, is basically getting your website to rank in Google in this, this section here, in the natural section for keywords, for certain keywords. And the way you always start is by doing on-page optimization, which is what I just went through. 
and you focus mainly on just the converting keywords. And then there's what's known as offline search engine optimization, which is where you would build text links on third party websites pointing to these converting pages or your, your home page as well. And you would do what's known as anchor text links, which is like this, if you can see the blue link here is personal injury claim. So it says personal injury claim, but that would have a link underneath pointing to the personal injury claim um, page that is totally relevant to that keyword on my website. So if it was usclaims.com, it would point to usclaims.com forward slash personal injury claim. And then everything is relevant. Now, we're not here today to give a full SEO lesson. I will recommend a site that you should definitely go and check out, which is my good friend James Schramko, who's, who's put on this fantastic site. And there's lots of free training on there. There's quite a few free modules you can start off with. And if you like it, I think you can upgrade and get the rest of the modules for the massive amount of, I think it's $79 or something like that. I don't know why he's done it so cheap, but he has, and it's trafficgrab.tv. Great information there. I would, don't head there now, just make a note of it and take action at the end of this. Uh, but a great place to really, if you really want to get stuck into your search engine optimization and your other ways of getting traffic, that is definitely a good place to go. Another way of getting good SEO very, very quickly, rather than starting with, you know, a brand new domain name, and because when you start with a brand new domain name, it takes a long while for Google to go, well, actually, we trust you now, we're gonna rank you for certain keywords. It's what's known as gaining authority with Google. And you have to build links naturally over a long period of time for this to happen. You have to build lots of pages on your website and get lots of pages in next. Well, there's a very, very quick way of shortcutting this, and that's by buying aged domain names or websites. And you can do this through my software, which is DomainFace. A lot of you probably already know about DomainFace, and you can go to this, domainface.com. And this searches lots of different domain selling websites and auctions and also, you know, flipper.com and places like that where they sell websites. And it pulls them all into one place and shows you those domain names that are worth buying that have lots of page rank, lots of backlinks and lots of pages already indexed. End of plug. Sorry, I had to plug my software in there. Nathan Ridley, who's my business partner on that, wouldn't have allowed me to do this presentation without a little shameless plug in there. The I'll, I'll actually give you an example of a new domain name versus an aged domain name. This is a real life example as well. I got into a niche a couple of years back now, lead generation niche, of course, because that's what I love doing. The reason I love lead generation is because it doesn't involve PayPal and all these payment terminals. All I do is get people to fill out a form online, which is easy peasy. And then once that's done, I either utilize it for my own business or I sell the lead to somebody else. And I absolutely love it. And in this particular example, I was just doing this to sell leads to somebody else. And I set off with a new domain name. And after 24 months, I was producing a very healthy 250 leads per month. And I think we got paid about 15 pounds, English pounds per lead for that particular website, which we were really, really happy with. And wait for this. I managed to get my hands on an aged domain name about 12 months into this. And it was, I paid quite a bit of money for it. It had a very high page rank. It had thousands of pages indexed in Google. It was had lots of very powerful backlinks and it had an exact match keyword in the domain. That's another thing I forgot to mention. Exact match keywords in domains really do still rank well in Google. For example, personalinjuryclaims.com would rank really well for personal injury claims because it's got personal injury claims in the URL. Well, this was the same for this niche. I had the .com. It was the best one that I could have. I paid a lot of money for it, but check this out. After just 12 months, it was producing over 500 leads per month. That's twice the amount 
of the new domain after two years. So this to me, actually, when we looked at the figures, it resulted in 300% more profit in half the time with a fraction of the work. So new domain names are great. Yeah, they're all good and stuff. But if you can get a really powerful age domain name or website, then that is going to help you really shortcut the whole process. So once you've done that, the next step is to build your sites. Once you've started learning how to get traffic and build a good website that's producing money for you and you're happy with it, now, well, it's time to build out more. Build the sites into a strong network. Now, let's have a look what a network looks like. If you had a, a massive industry authority site, well, let's stick with the personal injury claims. Personal injury is actually a part of a bigger industry. It's only a market within an industry. And this is my terminology. It's not a standard terminology or anything. This is just my terminology. And this would sit, personal injury would sit in within claims management, for example, which is the overall industry. And if you were to build an overall industry website, um, it would be claims management and personal injury would sit in that as a market. And then there would be stuff like financial redress, uh, which is, you know, bank charges stuff, which is massive at the moment. Uh, medical negligence, employment claims, professional negligence, so on and so forth. So let's pull out one of those markets, personal injury, can, you know, seeing as we're on that theme, and look how that's broken down. Well, that actually has what I call niche authorities within that as well. So it can be broken down again. So road traffic accidents is a niche authority. So is work-related injuries, as is criminal injury, slip and trip, animal attacks, holiday accidents. I know it all sounds very doom and gloom, this, but it happens out there and it happens a lot. And that's why these markets are massive. Well, let's break that down again and pull out what I like to call the niche authority. So road traffic accidents would be a niche authority. And that again breaks down again into what I call micro niche authorities, whiplash, neck injury, motorcycle. So let's break down that micro niche authority, um, whiplash. And that breaks down again into what I like to call micro niche satellites. And we can break that down into just whiplash compensation. But when you look at the low level stuff like whiplash compensation, which would be a lot easier to rank for than in you know claims management or personal injury or something like that. It might be where you want to start because it's a lot easier to rank. And also these key words are going to convert a lot higher as well because they're what's known as long tail keywords. And it just means that people who type these keywords in are a lot more exact in what they want. Whereas the bigger keywords like personal injury it's quite a broad keyword that, so it doesn't mean that there's somebody there who wants to fill out a form. It's where someone types in whiplash compensation claim, then they're pretty much more um, inclined to complete a form because personal injury, it could be a solicitor typing it in, it could be someone you know studying personal injury at university, it could be lots of different things. And that's why they're not as good as keywords and they don't convert as high. But whiplash compensation, for example, here is a micro, micro niche satellite. You could probably have a 10 page website on there. And if you built, you know, if you got involved in that industry, you could start there and you could build at least, you know, 300 to 1,000 of these little micro niche satellite sites. You may want to start at the micro niche authority level. And if that's the case, you probably have a pay, you know, you probably have about 30. To, to 50, maybe 100 of these as well, with about 100 pages on those. Um, if you started at niche authority level, you probably have 15 to 50 of these with at least 250 pages each of on, on those. Um, in this particular industry, it'd be different with different industries and you know, it depends how they're broken down. Um, if you started at market authority, you probably have you know five of these, maybe more, and these would have at least 500 to 1,000 pages. These, these are big sites. You know, you could build lots more, but you'd, you'd want to really be starting off with that and really getting big on that. If you started at industry level, you'd, you know, you'd have one of these to start off with, and, you know, you'd have at least 1,000 uh, pages 
on that. And then, of course, you could build more out as well and build different brands and stuff like that. And you could build all of these. And the good thing about all of these is you can repurpose the information onto the next one. So micro niche satellite, if you built you know, hundreds of those, well, each of those pages on those, you could re-spin the content and put them onto the industry authority or the market authority and so on and so forth. And this is how I've done it throughout my time in different industries um, and different markets is build out these networks so that you actually dominate all top 10 spots in Google, all top 20 spots in some cases with different brands so that people, if they fill out a form on there, they go into you and not go into any of your competitors. You've also got to look at pushing your local listings. And this means include your address on the contact page of the website. Just make sure it's there. That helps for local listings. Host in your local country if you can do. This also helps. And so, you know, have your hosting in the UK if you're in the UK or America if you're in America or Australia if you're in Australia. Also claim your Google Business Places page. Just type in Google Business Places into Google. This will explain exactly how you do that. It's dead simple and it'll take you a couple of minutes. There's actually companies out there, can you believe it, that actually charge you to do this? Do never pay anyone to do this. It takes minutes. Companies paying, charging $500 to do that. Um, it's outrageous. Also claim your Facebook businesses page. Again, just type that into Google or Facebook and it'll explain exactly how to do that. Again, doesn't take long. Add Web 2.0 into the mix as well. Again, don't do all this at once. Do stuff step at a time and start making money and profits on one step before you do the next step. Set up a Facebook page. Um, you know, if you do, you know, for your business, if you do this, make sure you get the vanity URL. This always just looks good on business cards later on down the line, and it just helps people remember the vanity URL. So, for example, if your website was usclaims.com and then you probably want facebook.com um, forward slash US claims. And the way you do this is you go to facebook.com forward slash username. And you need to have at least 25 fans before you can actually do this. Also, you may want to look at setting up a Facebook group. Um, I do this within Facebook for my industry group. So I'll set up a Facebook group for the industry uh, without people knowing actually who's actually behind it. And then I get to control that industry. Um, Twitter pages, Google Plus, YouTube channel is really good. You know, you can get lots of extra traffic from all of these sources. You know, Foursquare, Posterous, Dig, Squidoo, and there's lots more out there. Um, adding Web 2.0 is free, and that's one of the pros of it. One of the cons is you don't actually ever own it, and any efforts you put on there is in the hands of a third party. But I can't see Facebook going out of business very soon anyway. Also, you may want to look at Facebook advertising as well. Jen Sheehan, a really good friend of mine, is absolutely smashing it with Facebook marketing. She does it a lot of stuff for some of the big marketers, Frank Kern, James Framco, um, Shoe Money, lots of them out there. And I've learned a lot from Jen in this area. I was chatting to her in San Diego recently, and you know some of the techniques you can use within Facebook advertising is really powerful. And the beautiful thing is, is it's relevant to the um, demographics. So the information we looked at earlier by using Quantcast and stuff like that, you know, it comes in really powerful at this point because you know what demographic you're actually aiming for. So if you, you know, if your demographic is mainly women of a certain age, then you just advertise to that demographic, which is really good. Talking to Jen recently and she said, you know, just make sure you change your images a lot and test different images, use attention grabbing images. You know, they say out there that images of faces really help as well, you know, especially female faces, even when you're advertising to women or men tend to get higher click through rates. Find out who your prospects like, you know, who, what other um, companies do they like or what other people within your industry do they like and then you can actually advertise to the people that like all of these people or, or services or companies it's really really powerful facebook advertising but like i say one step at a time get one thing right and then move on to the next so that's how you you know a good way there on how you can turn on the traffic tap 
Let's move to the really important stuff now, because you might already have traffic. The really important step now is how you attract people to you in a major, major way. How to maximize attraction. And when you're thinking about maximizing attraction, whatever you do, whether it's websites, whether it's Facebook pages, whether it's direct mail, advertising in newspapers, or billboards, you need to think along these three lines, and that's simplicity, clarity, and make it intuitive as well. So make sure it's simple, always think, make sure it's simple, make sure it's clear, make sure the steps are clear, and make sure that it's very intuitive, that the journey that you're gonna give to this customer is very intuitive as well. You also need to leave your ego at the door here because we're fortunate enough to live in a time where we can use the internet. We can do all of our testing in days, sometimes hours, rather than months and weeks. Some of you may remember direct mail. Some of you may come from a direct mail um, background. And those days, you know, I did direct mail and you were waiting weeks for results. Now you can get results really, really quickly and you can test. And it's not a case of, well, I think this one's going to work. And then your colleague says, well, I think this one's going to work. And, and your ego's getting in the way. And that's happened years and years over advertising. Well, nowadays you can test it. So you just test it. There's no ego here. And sometimes you find that the one you least thought was going to work, smashes it. I had it recently. I was helping a friend out, actually, who's got a, a very posh bar and restaurant um, here in Manchester. And I said, no, seriously, I think this subject line will work. And he, he's got a copywriter who writes beautifully, actually. Um, but he's not really into sales, the, the, the copywriter. And I said, no, this subject, honestly, it's, it's going to smash it. But we'll test it with the copy copywriters. And um, we tested it with the copywriters. He knocked me out of the park. Don't know whether he got lucky or what, but it, the open rate was massive and I couldn't believe it. But this is what happens and you have to leave your ego at the door. I'm probably better at sales copy than him, but he beat me that time and you just never, never know. So you've got to leave your ego at the door. And it's all about improving the customer journey or experience. You've got to really improve their experience and make sure it's nice and smooth. And this is where... You know, checking out your, your competitors really comes in handy because you look at what they're doing. Was it a smooth experience for you? Did you enjoy it? You need to create the path of, it's a subtle path of least resistance for them. You need to be clear about what you're doing. What's your objectives here? What do you want to get out of this for your customer? What do you think they want to get out of it as well? And you need to marry the two. As I mentioned before, you need to be prepared to test and experiment along the way, leaving your ego at the door. Keep doing this. Keep testing and refining. And don't generalize between markets and products. One thing that works in one market or industry might not work in the other. Obviously, start off using information you've found from other industries, definitely, because there are general things that usually work out. But always test, always, always test. When you're looking at advertising anywhere, whether it be a website, like I say, direct mail, whatever it may be, always think about using a very, very strong headline. And the headline, a lot of people get this wrong, think that the headline should just be all about selling the overall benefit of all the features a lot of people do of the actual system. But you should be selling the value, the headline should be there to sell the value of entering into the first step of your lead funnel. That's what it's there for. It should be there to grab attention and you should also suggest within the headline how easy and fast it is. People love to know how easy and fast it is. You also need to be believable but be specific as well and use proof wherever you can. And it should be relevant to your target market, of course. And, you know, for, for example, should it be subtle or bold? For example, my friend who's in the very cool, um, trendy bars and restaurants industry in Manchester, we have to look at it totally different to how we would look 
for example, in the mortgages industry, where you're just trying to get every Joe Schmo um, to complete a form to take up a mortgage. Whereas this cool, ultra cool bar, he really wants to filter out Joe Schmoes and just wants the high level end of society. Uh, so he's a lot more subtle with his headlines and rightly so. Images, again, as Jen said, you know, for um, any kind of Facebook advertising, they need to be very attention grabbing and trial and test whether you're gonna use positive or negative um, depending on the message. You know, um, for a positive one, you'd have, you know, the success, successful outcome of using your product or service. So someone punching the air and, you know, smiling. Obviously, try not to be too cheesy. Or you may, you know, for negatives, the pain of someone who didn't use your service, someone who's holding debt, you know, lots of bills in their hands because they're deep in debt. I know it's moody as hell, but these things work. Um, have whatever it is pointing at where you want them to go. Look at this little man on a horse pointing to the writing here. Or if there was a form there, you'd want it pointing to the form. So if someone's face is slightly tilted, you know, if you've got a picture of somebody, you know, on the image, and it's slightly tilting, then make sure it's tilting towards the form. And if it isn't, reverse it so that it is. Or whatever you're trying to do, or pointing towards the telephone number. Or if you want them to read a bit of copy, point it towards the copy. For example, if you look um, at this image on that side, it kind of draws you away from the message, draws you away from the page. So that's really important. Social proof. You know, you'll hear marketers talk about this all the time. You know, if you have any stats or real information on, you know, how many members you have or how many people you've helped, you know, um, who've used your service or your product, then make sure you've got it on your site. Show people. People really need to see this. Remember to keep it relevant, though, to, to your perfect customer or client. Another great way of social proof is social media plugins. Look at this on my blog here, an interview with um, a good friend, Ed Dale. Look at what I've got there. I've got the Facebook like plugin, which shows that 23 other people liked this particular post I did with Ed. 19 comments as well. I've not pointed an arrow to that, but there's 19 comments. Again, social proof. Uh, 13 people retweeted it. And then if you look on the right-hand side here, there's a social uh, plugin for my actual Facebook page. And it shows here that 1,100 people like this, just over 1,100. And it shows, you know, friends of the person as well. So whoever's viewing this, if any of their friends like it, it will show them first. You know, my good friend there, Christine Pankhurst, and Jennifer Sheehan, Rainey there as well, Kevin McClellan, um, Guru Bob's on there as well. That's liking it. So it all adds to this social proof. So use those wherever you can. When you're looking at content copy, you need to remember that each sentence is really important and you need to really take care with what you're writing. And this is the same as when you're doing videos as well. Each sentence should be used to entice people to the next sentence or call to action. And also write it as, and same with videos as well, write it as if you're talking to one person. Just like now I'm talking to you as one person, even though we both know that there's more than one person on this webinar right now. Talk about the benefits to the user and be specific as well. We've talked about benefits before. Be really specific within the, the content of what benefits they're gonna get, you know, that exact perfect customer that you're looking for. What are they gonna get? You know, answer the questions, what does this product or service do? Why is it there? How does it work? Answer so what or what if. Um, use bold to emphasize important benefits or statements as well. Break paragraphs up with bullet points or numbers. This is really good for people who just scan uh, like I do. I don't like reading stuff. So, you know, make it as well as bold and paragraphs and bullet points or highlight it in yellow, that type of thing. Think about any possible objections and make sure you cover these off within the copy because when people get off your website and they've got objections, you've lost them. Whereas you can cover them whilst you've got them or whatever, even if it's not a website, if it's Facebook page or any kind of advertising that you do. 
Use straightforward, simple language. Don't talk in any kind of big corporate chat. Um, you need to try and get people as down to earth as possible. Sound as down to earth as possible. That's what people want to hear. Be consistent throughout your message as well. Don't say one thing at the beginning and then you know say something that contradicts this towards the end. Subheadlines again. Some people like to read word for word. Others like me love to scan. Use subheadings again, like the bold, like the, the bullet points or numbers for the scanners. Video, very important. If you can use video, if you're quite happy with video, um, even if you're not happy with video, there's lots of different services out there that you know where you can get video made for you. Very, very cheap, they all free in some cases. Video can be used together with copy or on its own, but make sure you just test to see which combination wins. Video image, which is the image at the beginning of the video that, you know, before people click, the image in the background, should be used to convey trust or entice people to click. My good friends, um, the conversion rate experts who've taught me a lot about conversion, Ben and Carl, you know, they do stuff for Google. You know, Google employ them to do their conversion stuff. They do stuff for Apple and eBay and stuff like that. They're, they're big time. Amazon, all of these guys use the conversion rate experts. You know, they've taught me that, you know, if you've got a picture, always have in the background something that conveys trust. You don't want it to look salesy. So, for example, you may want to have a picture of you against the whiteboard so that people know that it's an educational video and it's not going to be a sales video. Use metaphors or stories. John Carlton talks a lot about this and his business partner, good friend of mine, Stan, talks about this a lot. Use metaphors and stories. Stems back from when you were a child. You know, you learnt a lot around the world through stories and we still love a good story today and we still love metaphors today. So, and talk as if, like I said before, so good, I've written it twice this. Talk as if you're talking to one person. Credibility and trust, really, really important. If you've got a website, you need you want people to fill out that form. Um, you can also get people to fill out forms on Facebook pages as well, which I forgot to mention before. Um, you know, get testimonials wherever you possibly can and try and get people to give real examples of how your product specifically helped them. Wherever you can, use pictures of your testimonials, so real life pictures of their face. If you can get a video, brilliant, or an audio is better than just actual text as well. Also with credibility and trust, coattail, what's known as coattailing, means add logos of any of your big suppliers, customers, or anyone you've got any affiliation with whatsoever. Use their logos on your page. You know, you'll see it a lot of the time, people will use big credit card companies' logos, Visa, MasterCard, that type of thing, because these companies have spent billions on advertising, so you may as well coattail on the back of their advertising to convey trust and credibility. Well, it's the same with if you've ever helped any big customers uh, or suppliers, make sure you get their logos on there. Or you could show logos of any regulatory bodies um, that govern your industry, which also conveys trust and credibility. Or you may want to flaunt any positive press you may have received. Sometimes in, on some of our new lead generation sites, we, instead of um, having logos of, you know, the BBC or NBC or whatever it may be, and then pointing them to a press re review that they've done of us, we've sometimes cheekily just pointed them to news. So... We'd always disclose that we'd point, put at the top in very light grey, of course, news within the industry. And then we'd have a link underneath BBC. So all people see is really BBC, so that conveys the credibility and trust. And then it would have a link to another page on our website, which would be an iframe news story from the BBC of you know our particular industry or niche. And that allows us to do that. If you, if, if, you know the word iframe and stuff makes you quiver because it sounds too technical don't worry i'm not hugely technical i just employ technical people really really cheaply call to action really important you have to have 
call to actions, otherwise people don't know what to do next. But I'm sure you already know that. Keep the call to action in line with the integrity of your business or customers. So like I said before, you know, if you're uber cool in the street, then you don't want to have a really cheesy call to action. You may want to also scatter call to actions throughout as well, which I do with a lot of my copy. I'll have call to actions throughout. And you'll see it with, you know, big marketers. They'll have emails that they'll email out to people. If they've got a long copy email, they'll have call to actions every sort of like paragraph. Um, just giving you the chance to get into their sales funnel at any point, just so that, you know, a lot of people just have the call to action at the beginning and they're doing it wrong because someone might get to the end of the story or whatever you've done or the end of the content and completely forget about the call to action that was at the top. So you need to really kind of get them out there as well. It can be really powerful to mention any risk reducers like guarantees. If you offer guarantees, or if you offer any kind of you know, free 30 days or whatever it may be within the actual call to action or near the call to action. Offer simple, clear call to action choices. So you may want to offer different choices. Doing this can turn the call to action into an alt- what I call an alternate close. I learned this years ago when I was in recruitment. Um, it's called an alternate close. So instead of them saying, should I do this? They say, which way should I do this? Um, When I had my, I had an online talent director at one time and we'd do a lot of closing on the phones and the the hardest part was getting people to actually offer us their credit card details. They would be really into it, but when you came to the credit card details at the end, it just used to really scare people. And a lot of the time, it was the staff as well. They were nervous about it because they knew they were so close to the sale that they'd get really scared. And they would ask them the question. You know, they'd ask, um, uh, have you got a credit card on you? And 95% of people were like, uh, no, I don't actually, because it would give them the chance to get out of it and have a think about it because people love to have a think about things. And that's why you need to, you know, really get them into a call to action quickly. So we started learning well, how do we how do we reword uh, this so that we're not having a, asking a closed question, a yes or a no question at the end? How do we reword this? And the way we came up with was we gave an alternate close. So we said, okay, so how are you going to be paying for this? Is it going to be on credit or debit card? And they would instead of making it easy to say yes or no, they'd, they'd go, oh, um, uh, credit card. And you say, okay, so thanks. What's the long number across the front? And we found that we we got an uplift of sales of something like 90%. And it really, really did work. And it's the same with this, you know, ask them different questions at the end. So you may want to say, just complete the form or call this number, 0800, blah, 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 and get them into the sales funnel. Use scarcity as well, but be as subtle as you can. E.g., apply now to avoid any future price increases. You know, people are getting sick of these scarcity tactics, even though the big companies use them. Apple are massive at scarcity. How difficult is it to get an iPad? And they'll use all sorts of excuses. They had a very valid one this year because of the Japan incident, but I'm sure they'll have more next year, which will create scarcity and just makes people want it even more. When using forms, which is massive in lead generation, you know, you may just want to get people into onto the phone. Um, That might be your prerogative. But a lot of stuff I do is using forms. Now, we know in general, and this, like I said before, you can never be too general, always task. But in general, more fields on the form equals less conversion. So the more questions you ask, the least people will complete the form. The less fields equals less qualified. Now, we all know that to get the lead as hot as possible, we need them more qualified. So the way to get more questions is to ask more questions once the form is complete. And the way we do this is using a technology called Ajax, um, which basically just, once they've hit submit button or sign up now, whatever the button is, 
they at that point by the way submit is not a good button to use i don't know why i said that but the word submit is just not a nice word but once they've hit that button sign up now or whatever it may be then you may say would you mind answering a few more questions so that we can get the best quality of product or service to you as fast as possible and at that point instead of taking them to a new page which would be you know the normal html way of doing it i'm not technical but i think that's um, what would happen ajax keeps them on everything the same but just adds more fields at that point and it it psychologically makes it easier for them to complete it you want high conversion with high qualification this is a really good way of doing this have form on the actual page so or have it starting on the page the first step of the form starting on the page as well this usually gives a higher conversion as well so rather than saying click here to fill out a form you just have the, the name and email or whatever it is on the actual page um, test the positioning of this also test having mandatory and non-mandatory fields so you know where you've got little asterisks which requires them to fill it out otherwise the form won't be submitted um, test having mandatory and non-mandatory fields sometimes if you just have everything as non-mandatory so that they don't have mandatory then you'll get a more truthful completion of form because having mandatory fields sometimes makes people think oh god i've got to fill out this bit and they put in false details um, always have the forms above the fold so the fold is basically your computer screen if people need to scroll down to complete the form then that's not a good thing usually again test it tell them how their information is going to be tell them why the information sorry is really important tell you why you need the information also tell them how their information will be safe and how you don't like spam and that type of thing and let them know exactly what will happen next a lot of people out there in the cpa world for example just want people to fill out forms it's just about numbers whereas i like to have a very you know if it's for me i want the forms to be completed properly and qualified and i want them to be as as good as possible and if it's for my clients if people are you know buying this information for me and paying me every time i get a lead i want it to be excellent information because i want them to carry on buying the forms from me i want them to only use me and nobody else with phone numbers which is you know really important in lead generation you know if you if you tend to go down the phone side of things then always test it out but we like to have our phone numbers and we found out that having phone numbers on the top right hand side gives us a really good phone conversion um, test positioning size and color try having the phone number with call to actions as well always 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 have it on the contact page because that's where a lot of people will go to find you buttons you know the sign up now kind of thing look at what buttons the big companies like amazon are using and replicate they spend millions and millions on their buttons if they're using orange it probably works try it out try different you know colors try different sizes different position positions different messages as well arrows another kind of attention grabbing thing again test different size different color different positioning i'll give you an example on one of my lead generation niches we changed a red arrow into a green arrow and got five percent uplift in form completions it's amazing if you can you know just test these things out tracking when you're tracking all of this information you need to do it properly if you want to get good results and best way to do it online is google analytics it's completely free of charge with phone tracking what you can do there is use multiple numbers so you might have a different number for each different website so you can tell where the information has come from or different pages on the website if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of it or different traffic sources you know if something's come from pay-per-click you'll send them to a certain place um, which will have a certain number uh, or you know you can really drill it down to keywords if you're doing this big time well, how do you test all of this? Well, there's different types of testing on websites. There's what's known as A-B testing, which is your normal split testing. So you're testing an A page with a B page, so one page against another. 
and each time you'll just have something different. So you might, like I did, have a red arrow one time and a blue arrow the next time or green arrow the next time. So if you've got a thousand visitors, you'll show 500 visitors the green arrow and 500 visitors the red arrow. And we found that we had a 5% more um, of the people that saw the green arrow completed the form. There's also multivariate testing, which is testing um, multiple aspects of the page at the same time. So each new visitor gets a completely new page, um, which is really, really powerful. But you're probably best just starting off with simple A-B testing. And some free software to use is Google Website Optimizer which is really, really good. And you can find this at google.com forward slash website optimizer. Just make a note of this. Again, you can go to this in your own time afterwards. Good friends of mine, Tim Robinson and Brent Hodgson. Brent is also from Market Samurai. I've created something called Zen Tester, which is really good again. Go to zentester.com. Uh, they have a free version of that as well, which is really good. Another good um, paid subscription is Visual Website Optimizer and that is visualwebsiteoptimizer.com and all these places have videos that will show you how to use the software as well. Another good way of testing stuff is having a live chat button on there as well, live chat form on there as well. If you think about it you'll have hundreds, thousands of visitors who land on your site that never do anything. They never fill out a form, they never do anything. You, you don't know why. So a good way of finding out why is having a chat form on there. And good um, system is actually zopim.com, Z-O-P-I-M.com, and that has a free, free version as well. Usability testing is really, really powerful. Getting actual human beings to test your um, processes um, your journey, your customer journey is really, really powerful. And you'll find when you do usability testing that sometimes it's the simple things that you just miss because you couldn't see the wood through the trees. Or sometimes it's stuff that you just never would have thought of and you're like, wow, it's amazing that they've given us this information. And you can get real humans to test at usertesting.com or whatusersdo.com. Again, just make notes of this got plenty of time after this to go over to these sites. Make sure you choose people who are in the geographic location you're targeting as well. I had one of my mentoring students who did all of this and he was targeting uh, the UK, but he got someone in America to do it. And there are slight different cultural differences that do have an effect. So um, I got him to do it with the UK and he got much more out of it because obviously he was targeting the UK and he had the UK people doing it. Um, click mapping is pretty good as well. Crazy Egg um, is good. So that's crazyegg.com. Check that out, which just shows you where people are actually clicking. So you may get people clicking on a certain image on your website, for example. You know, most of the people who come to the site might be clicking on this image. And you're like, why? why are they clicking on that? And then there's nothing for them to go to. So if people are clicking on it, then utilize it. Have a link underneath it, maybe linking them to the form or linking them to something useful. So click mapping is really good as well. That give you great information. Customer surveys are really good. Um, you can use SurveyMonkey. So you can ask them questions, find out what they like about your service, what they don't like, what they would change about your service. Your customers are your best people to ask, you know, they're the ones who utilize your service or they're the ones who've experienced the journey of your service or your product. Refer a friend is really good as well. This again is good for traffic. It's good for conversion because if people are actually referring friends, then, you know, there's no better way of selling your product than getting someone to sell it for you. And referring a friend is great. Now, always when you do refer a friend, let them send personalized notes to their friend. And there's a very good reason for doing this, because especially if you have in your privacy policy that you may utilize this information, you should be reading what people are writing to their friends. This is really powerful information. Again, I learned this from the conversion rate experts 
you want to look at how they're selling your product or service to other people because this is really, really good information. It's, it's brilliant copy that you can use when you come to um, retest your website or do email outs or whatever you're going to do. So that is how you can maximize the attraction. And we've covered today on these three steps how to choose your prospect, prospects wisely, how to turn on the traffic tap, and also how to maximize attraction. But there is a fourth step, and that is pulling it all together to retain the winners and then replicating it. And also, how to sell leads to other people. You may be looking to get leads for yourself, but you might have an, uh, you know, too many leads that are coming through, so you need to sell them to other people. Or you may just be wanting to enter the lucrative world of lead generation so that you can sell leads to other people. And that's what the fourth step is all about as well, how to find these. So how to pull all this together, retain the winning customers, and then replicate. And also how to sell these leads for massive amounts of money to the right people who will keep buying these leads. Now... We have run out of time here today, but, and there is a but, if you'd like to master this and create a lucrative lead machine, I will actually help you. And you can use my experience, just like my mentoring students and my mastermind students are using my experience of well over 250 lead campaigns in hyper competitive industries, well over 30,000 man hours of testing and trialing. I've created two $10 million businesses. You can basically use my life's work to your advantage. And like I say, my mastermind students and mentoring students have, and they're getting massive, massive results. And I'm not asking you today at all to put your hands in your pockets and pull out credit cards and all that type of thing. What I'm offering if you'd like a hand, is a free premium lead machine coaching session. If you head over to leadsession.com. Now, when you land on the website, it's just a really simple form that you need to complete to request the free session with me. It asks you loads of bizarre questions about your deepest, darkest secrets, that type of thing. You know the score. No, I'm only joking. There might be a few bizarre questions on there, but you'll get through it, I'm sure. And once you've completed the form, which is actually very simple, that will then come off over to us. We'll take a look at it and just check whether we think that you're a good fit for us right now for this particular project. And also whether we're a good fit for you. We might not be the right thing for you right now. And we'll politely tell you. And there's, you know, it's not one of those where there's hard feelings or anything. I'm sure we'll do stuff together in the future. But I just like to be really honest from the beginning and make sure that um, we're all right for each other. And once that happens, then you'll, you know, if you are right for us and we're right for you, then my VA will set up a meeting with you and I. It'll either be a physical meeting um, if you're locally or it will be over Skype or over the phone. Um, we'll have a chat where I'll go through, you know, your complete business with you and set a strategy for you so you can create your own lead machine. At the end of the meeting, I will tell you about some, you know, some more advanced stuff that we've got. And remember, my new way of doing stuff doesn't involve any kind of hard pitches. If somebody is not up for something, then there's no point in really trying to push them into it because they'll just fall out at a later stage anyway. So it'll be a case of a very um, low level. I'll ask you whether you want to, you know, take up some extra advanced stuff. At the end, if, you, if you're not into it, no problem. But if you're up for it, we can look at that as well. But just bear in mind, there is only one of me. So this is real scarcity. None of this BS scarcity. There is actually only one of me. So get yourself over to leadsession.com as soon as you can, i.e. now get over there. If you don't go over there, by the way, no problem. I will hopefully catch up with you again soon. In the meantime, though, if you need anything at all, just give me a shout. Speak to you soon.